John chapter 4, 1 through 14. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is, that ask you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Good morning. It's great to uh, see all of you here. Welcome everyone who is... uh, participating with us on, online as we wrap the series up um, called Compelled. Really, and it's what it is, is an exploration into the way of Jesus. Um, it's interesting, I, I read passages like we just heard read to us, and there are some really powerful things that Jesus says. He says, if you knew, right, this woman's like, you know, Jesus asked for a drink. She's like, you don't have, you know, why are you asking me this? And Jesus, if you knew who this was, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink. And then what does he say? He says, you would, you would receive a living water that would cause you to never thirst again. And he, he was always doing stuff like this. And for a lot of us, this is what he offers to us. And I think a lot of it is if you knew who he was. What, what I'm hoping that we will do, that our exploration is to actually understand who he really is. Like to, for him to say to us, if you knew who I really was, to say we're learning, we're growing, we're understanding that more and more and more. And specifically, what I want for us to be able to do uh, in this series is to at least have a glimpse or an understanding of what the way of Jesus actually looks like. What does it look like for you and I to live in his way? What are the things that we look for? What are the things that motivate our actions? How do we treat other people? How do we enter into the chaos of our culture? That's what I want for us to explore. And we've been talking about this idea that the way of Jesus, that everybody has a way, right? of life that is governed by something. And the way of Jesus is governed by, by love, by God's love. It's the rule of God's love. That's what we operate in as we live, learn to live and walk in his kingdom in the way of Jesus. The uh, way the kingdom works is uh, sort of this loop rather than in our way, it's proof and evidence. It's really faith and trust. We see something and then it causes us to act accordingly. It's faith and trust. We'll talk more about this in just a minute. The reason is because what Jesus continually emphasizes is trust, trust, trust. And the reason is because trust is the foundation for relationship. And that's actually the way you and I are intended to live. We're not designed to be efficient cogs in systems and machines. We're designed to live in relationships. This basically sets up what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to create a system that's fair. He came to bring the promise a fullness to all of humanity, to you and to me. And then ultimately what we talked about is that with that, the way we interact in this world is we're not pressured to find solutions to problems because of God's incredibly powerful promise of redemption. And that's how this whole thing begins to unfold. So we're looking for how do we walk in this way? What are the markers of it? Over the last uh, four weeks, if you remember, 
way back six weeks ago. Some of you don't remember this. Um, but six weeks ago, we began this series by talking about that one of the things that Jesus came to fulfill was this prophecy in Isaiah. And this prophecy in Isaiah, it was this exchange that we had to release some things in order to receive some things. It was the, the Jesus, when we see him, he compels us to release, to offer. He gives beauty for ashes, right? He gives, um, for, for, uh, he gives a, a garment of praise for our mourning, for our sadness, for our downcast souls. He gives an oil of joy for our despair. He covers us, but it has to be this exchange. We release, we're, we don't have to hold on to the things that we're ashamed of. We don't have to, we, we are free to release all the things that we hold on to, that we hide, that we conceal, that we make our identities. We are free to release those in light of what we receive. And today I wanna to talk about how we receive things. And then between these weeks or the last few weeks, we've given these four kind of promises, these four things that mark people who walk in the way of Jesus. What do you and I bring to the table when we uh, uh, sort of come to the world around us, we enter into the chaos? Uh, thing number one is we said that people who walk in the way of Jesus, we meet poverty with dignity because of the promise of God's fierce love. We, 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 meet, we, we bring dignity to human beings. We never, ever, ever treat someone in a way that strips their humanity or undermines their dignity or demeans them or devalues them. We are always those who are first to see the image of God born in the lives of human beings, of other human beings, and to call it out, to work for the dignity of others. That drives a lot of why we enter into a lot of the conversations we do and a lot of the emphasis we do, the idea of dignity. That we talked about the fact that brokenness is met with hope, that we never, ever have a reason to be without hope because of what Jesus has done, because of his promise of redemption. He doesn't solve problems. He takes broken things and destroyed things and he uses them to bring beauty and glory and uh, uh, the story of God's faithfulness throughout the world. And so there's this idea that we are never ever without hope. You and I are never without hope. And this is what we get to bring to the world around us. I hope that you see how important this is. Our world is looking around and they're like, they just see it's hopeless and it's just the, the, the trends are telling us that's how people feel. And you and I are brokers of hope. We bring it to every situation you feel, Mike, why in the world are you so hopeful? Because God is so faithful. Right, for us to learn how to live in that. That's what we bring. Into uh, bondage, we bring freedom. You and I live as free people. It's interesting, I have people talk to me all the time. They're like, Mike, they wanna, ask me what I think is right and wrong and always don't have conversations about what do I think about this issue or that issue. Mike, is this right or is this wrong? It's interesting what you see Jesus talk about more than anything else. He doesn't talk about right and wrong. He talks about freedom. He talks about what frees you. Or when people talk to me, they say, Mike, what is right and wrong? What about, I said, well, let me, let me ask you this. Forget about whether it's right or wrong. Does this bring you freedom? Well, no, but that's a different story. No, it's not. That's the story. What we do as people who live in the way of Jesus, what we are after is human fullness, not to be right, not to have our systems fair. We want you to be full and free. That's what Jesus came to do. And last week we talked about the fact that Jesus meets blindness or this lack of perspective, this darkened state. He meets darkness with faith because there's this promise of revelation. This is from last week. So if you've not been here, this makes no sense to you. So you have to go watch the last five weeks and that'll help you. Faith. A lot of us use faith as a noun. This is our faith. And it's the things that we believe, the system that we believe in that's supposed to work on our behalf. That's not how faith is described um, in the scriptures. And so a lot of us keep coming to church or to God, or in our case, coming to Jesus, and you're looking for certain things. You're looking for certain things. And so what I want to do is I want to help us and frame how we come to Him, and more importantly, how we learn how to receive from Him. I want for us today to think about when we meet Jesus, to see Him and to be compelled to receive from Him. That's, that's the task today. So um, when I was uh, uh, a few, several years ago, 25 years ago, so I was with uh, two friends and there were three of us and we ran around together a lot. And this third friend, I'll call him friend number three, he came from a very prim and proper family, very formal. And me, you know how formal I am. And then my other friend was way less formal and a lot more 
unrefined, shall we say, than even myself. And so we were invited to go eat with this third, this third friend, friend number three, and his formal parents at his formal parents' house. And they were going to create this big feast for us. So we got on our best behavior and we went over to his house and we enjoyed a spread among spreads. It was like meat, potatoes. It was just like all the things that you would want just to stuff your face. And we got done. And friend number one, my less refined friend, he had pushed back from the table. He says, man, I am stuffed. And to which everybody went, oh. And friend number three looks over and says, we don't say we're stuffed. We say, I am very well satisfied. Thank you. <laughs> There's a big difference, right? There's a big difference. Man, I am stuffed. I got exactly what I wanted. I am very well satisfied. Thank you. Do you know what I notice? as I just read through the life of Jesus, I see a couple of things that he emphasizes. One is his capacity to be sufficient, wholly sufficient, and to satisfy. When he said, if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. What is he saying? I have the capacity to satisfy you. We're gonna look at it in just a minute when he says, if you eat the bread that I give, if you eat the bread that is me, you'll never hunger again. That means he has the capacity to satisfy you. So my question would be, does he satisfy you? Like, why is it that we're not experiencing that? Why is it we keep chasing all these other things to try and satisfy, to try and feel something in us? And what's missing is this is exactly what we're called to do. This is the second thing. Jesus emphasized over and over again this idea of faith. Almost every time that he, in fact, every time he healed someone, what he commended them for is their faith. Your faith has made you whole. I've never seen greater faith of all the people in Israel. He said to the centurion who was coming to him to heal his son, your faith has made you whole to the woman who reached out and grabbed his garment. The guys who bring the friend to him and lower him through the roof, he says, he sees their faith and he responds to them. It's always faith. In fact, when he talked to his disciples, they get in the boat, they go across the boat. Uh, Jesus is asleep at the front. A storm arises and they think they're gonna die. They're like, oh my gosh, you're gonna die. And Jesus stands up and you know what he says to them? Oh, you have little faith. Now I'm going, no, 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 it's not faith. Do you not see the waves and the wind? Do you not see all this? He's like, no, what you don't see is who you're with. Oh, you have little faith. When they're all freaking out about worrying about what they're gonna eat or how they're gonna pay their bills or where they're gonna get this, Jesus says, don't you know that God feeds the sparrows and the birds of the air and he lilies of the field, he closes more splendid than Solomon? Oh, you of little faith faith. Do not worry about tomorrow. Oh, you, he's, he talks about this over and over again. So the question is, what is it? What is it? A lot of us are familiar. Maybe you have this hung up somewhere at your house or somewhere that you see regularly. It's Hebrews 11, chapter one. It may be the most popular definition of faith in the world, perhaps. And it says this, it says, now faith is the assurance of things that are hoped for. It's the assurance of things that are hoped for. The conviction of things that are unseen. The assurance of things hoped for. Right, it matters how you come to Jesus. If you're hoping to get stuffed and go, oh man, I'm stuffed. And he's like, no, 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 no. I came to satisfy you. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. In fact, what we're gonna read today is one of those troubling passage, passages of all that we see Jesus say. In John chapter six, if you have your Bibles, you wanna turn there. If you got your phone, you can pull it out and flip there. And then if I get bore, boring, you can just scroll your Instagram feed or whatever. So in Mark, in John chapter six, he says this. Um, uh, he's talking about, you know, basically he feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, this little boy's lunch. You probably heard this story. He feeds 5,000 people. There's a miracle. People are like, oh my gosh, can you believe he did that? That was so cool. He fed us all. We're all super stuffed. We love this. They go searching for Jesus. There's a little story that happens in between, but they get to where Jesus is. They finally find him on the other side of the, uh, other, other side of the lake. And they go, man, we finally found you. We were looking all over for you. And this is what Jesus says to them. He says, you came looking for me because you had your bellies 
full, not because you saw the things of God. You, you came to me because you thought, oh man, you're stuffed, but you have not yet learned what it is to be very well satisfied. Thank you. It's the difference between just continuing to come and take and take and take and learning to receive and learning to receive. This is how God avails himself to us. In fact, the next verse, one of, the, one of my favorite past descriptions, the way faith works, and it's been true in my life, uh, for all of my life, I'm gonna share some about that today. But in Romans chapter one, uh, there's a really famous passage. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's a really powerful verse. And then in verse 17, it says this, for in it, in the gospel, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. How? From faith for faith. Therefore it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I don't know if you realize this, we are very intolerant of uncertainty, which means we are very intolerant of faith. I used to believe my whole life that the way you built your faith is by eliminating doubt. The more certain you can be, the more faithful you are. And it's exactly the opposite of that. Faith actually exists at its most poignant when the certainty is least available. When the wheels are off, when you can't figure out a way, that's when your faith actually matters more than any other time. And we arrange our lives to avoid this. And what Romans teaches us, what Paul says, is that the righteousness of God, the fullness of his life in you and in me is revealed from faith for another step of faith for another step of faith, for another step of faith. One of the things that we talk about around here, we've really wrestled through this and what we've come to learn is the faith that you had 10 years ago is not sufficient for the faith you need for tomorrow. The faith you had yesterday is not sufficient for tomorrow. What happens is, especially the older we get, we start talking about the stories of our distant past when God was faithful back then. It's because we didn't understand what it means from faith to faith or from faith for faith. It's just each step of faith only because he's doing things. He's building your faith in him such that you trust him more and more and more and more and more. Why? Because he's designed you to live in a relationship with him, a life giving, soul refreshing relationship with him. In fact, in this later passage, Jesus tells them, he says, you know, um, I've got to be about the work of God. And this is all in John 6. I got to be about the work of God. And they're like, what's the work of God? Tell us what the work of God is. And listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 26, verses 29. He says, Jesus answered, the work of God is this. You want to know what the work of God is? This is it. To believe in the one he has sent. The work of God is not you to go in the ministry or not for you to do. The work of God is for you to learn how to believe. To walk in such a way that demonstrates your faith and your trust in Him. In Him. How do we do this? How do we do this? So I began several years ago. I don't know how long ago. But my whole life has been marked um, I think by a lot of insecurity. Most people probably wouldn't, wouldn't know that unless you know me, unless you've, you know, but it's just, it's, it's always been. So I've lived most of my adult life feeling like I was in over my head, which I still do. Uh, people come into Port City and they see Port City and they meet me and they're very surprised. And I'm like, no one is more surprised than me. I have lived most of my life feeling like I'm in over my head. It has taken me a very long time to find a measure of peace in what I get to participate in. But I'll tell you what's helped me a lot. And for people would come to me and they would give me these really, really sweet compliments. Mike, that message just really helped me so much. Or they'll even say things as pointed as, Mike, you have changed my life. And what I would always do, and what, I know what they meant, right? We know what they meant. I think you know that. And, and I would always be, oh, thank you. you know, thank you. And I would deflect, you know, everybody's so great and God's so good and blah, 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 blah. And, and, I, and I thought I was being polite. 
until what I realized was I was, and I was actually deflecting things. When someone told me something that I felt like spoke to me or encouraged me in a deep place, I would say thank you as a way to deflect it. Thank you so much. But you know, these guys are really good and God's really faithful. We got a great team and all that's really nice and it's all true. But I had to say, God, what's happening to me? And I realized what I was doing is I was always deflecting things to keep from having to deal with the responsibility that I felt when I was encouraged. So this is what I started saying. Someone says, Mike, thank you for what you've done or they'll give me some compliment, Mike, you know, what you've taught or what you've done. And you know what I say to them now? I just go, I'll receive that. I'll receive that. If someone buys your lunch, you just say, I'll receive that. I'll receive what it is. Let me tell you, let me tell you why. Because when you receive something, you're taking it into your soul. What it has done for me personally is when I recognize that the things that are happening in and through our church are significant in the lives of people. It's one thing to say thank you and deflect it. It's another thing to receive it and recognize that's what God has called me into and to have the courage to step into that, to receive his call on my life. A lot of us get encouraged by one another and we say, oh, thank you, or no, it's not that big of a deal or anything else. Instead of saying, I'll receive that. And you step in to the courage that you've actually been given. And you begin to take responsibility for what someone else sees in you or believes in you, especially God. As someone who struggles with insecurity, the worst thing for me or the easiest thing for me is to always pretend that I do not have what it takes and to stay hesitant and to stay back. And that's not what God has called me to do. So when I receive what it is, when I receive it, I take it in, it affects me. I step into the reality of it. And then I begin to take responsibility for what it is that God is asking me to do for the courage that I'm given. So you say, I'll receive that. It's kind of weird at first. When someone buys you dinner and and gives you a compliment, instead of saying, thank you, you just say, I'll receive that. They're gonna go, whoa, it's kind of weird. And so you tell them why. Because here's what happens. I can give you story after story from this morning that happened. Things that make me feel uncomfortable. But what happens, I'll go ahead and give it to you. Clay stood up here this morning, talked about, we're gonna hear from our pastor, Mike, right? I'm like, oh, man, I'm just Mike. I'm, just, I'm, I'm not that person. And what happens is when he, when he says that, I have to go come stay. I receive that. That's what God has asked me to do in this moment. So I step into it. And then what I'm free to do is to offer And when you start to learn to live like this, instead of being a system of give and take, which is what the whole world does, we live in a different system of receiving and offering, receiving and offering. It's a very different way to live. If you explain that to someone, they're not gonna think it's nearly as weird for you to tell them you'll receive it. So just say, I'll receive that. We gotta understand what this means, what this looks like, how we do this. In John chapter six, Jesus is about to start talking about food again and food that satisfies in fact, he says it like this. And this is how he starts. Once they kind of get into this, um, he, they're basically going, you know, they talk about, he says, my work is to do the will of, I mean, my work, the work of God is to believe. And they start going, well, what sign are you going to give us? Our ancestors, they wandered in the desert and God fed them from bread, or Moses fed them from bread that fell out of heaven. And here's Jesus' response to that. John chapter six, verse 32. And in fact, what happens in these next few verses becomes the reason why people stopped following him in the first place. So this should be a lot of fun. Then Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. I mean, isn't that what you would say? Let me have it. Then Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Here's another place where Jesus just says, I have the capacity to satisfy you. So here's these food metaphors again. Now, much of my adult life, I lived under the oppression of a seventh grade boy diet. I was a super picky eater. Meat, potatoes, I consider myself a food separatist for most of my adult life. 
If you don't know what a food separatist is, it's a really important thing. It's like what happens when, you, when you're at somewhere, you actually like the plates that are divided. Because like if you're at a, somewhere and like the juice from your beans starts getting your potatoes, you're like, oh gosh. Because <sighs> you don't want to touch them. It just messes everything up. So I would live like this most of my life. And so I'd go to restaurants, especially nicer restaurants. And, and uh, I learned this from my younger brother, uh, Brian. But I was, because uh, we were both picky for a long time. But I'd go to these restaurants, really nice restaurants. And I'd look at the menu, or I'd hear the specials. And I'm listening for all the key words like onions or vegetables, eh, like anything. And so I'm listening and so I'd order something. I'm like, I want this right here, but I want no onions, no this, no that, no this. And so I want this done the way I want it done because I don't like any of this other stuff. And then everybody who ate with me was always embarrassed, like, oh my gosh. So I was with my brother one day, we were eating somewhere and the waiter comes out and says, you know, gives us the special and um, Brian asks him what's on it. He's like, there's all this crazy stuff on it that I would never eat. And then uh, Brian goes, I'll take the special. I was like, dude, you're like as picky as I am. What's happened? He said, Mike, do you realize the guy who's back there cooking the food is trained? Like he knows how to put flavors together. He knows how to do what it is that he's doing. You can trust the chef. I said, huh? Give me the special too. All right, and here, here's, you know where I'm going with this, Right? Because when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life who came out from heaven, a lot of you are going, I don't like that, and I don't like that, and I don't like that, and I don't like that. Give me all this, hold all the hard stuff. And you actually are trying to receive Jesus on your terms because you've never learned to trust or to receive and trust what it is that you were being given. Because you think that somehow it's not going to fit or do what you want it to do. And therefore you are never satisfied because you've never actually received what is actually given. Do you know what I found? I love food. I eat all kinds of crazy food now. I didn't think for a second that my seventh grade palate would ever change. It has been radically transformed. I eat ginger veggies all the time. I eat all kinds of beans. I eat all kinds of fruits. I eat all kinds of vegetables. I eat almost anything that is served to me. Your palate can be transformed if you will learn to receive the person that you trust, right? That's what you got to do. It's, it's so crazy. Like you, this is just free. For those of you who drink your coffee with tons of cream and sugar in seven days, seven, seven days, you can learn to drink black coffee because you can change your palate. It can happen. And I don't believe this, but you can. It's the work of God to believe. That's exactly what he says. <laughs> Y'all, the principle's no different. You and I can be transformed if we will stop self-selecting the things we want about Jesus and eliminating the things we want. Here's why you do it. Here's why I do it. We pick out all the stuff that we like and we leave out all the stuff that we don't we customize it so that we already uh, get what we already, so that we get what we already like and what we're already familiar with. And that is the recipe to stay stuck and to never experience the fullness of what it is that God has promised for you. It is from faith for faith. Here's what he goes on to say. In verse 47, we'll skip down. He says, very truly, I tell you, this is going to get really good. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and yet they die. But here is the bread of life that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And then the Jews began arguing sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? This is very offensive to the Jewish culture, right? In fact, I thought about this earlier. I was like, this is actually very offensive to every culture. Jesus said to them, very truly, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and you drink his blood, you have no life in you. Unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides, remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and they died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. What in the world is that? Like, what is he doing really? Jesus is very intentional about about using this metaphor of food. A lot of people have used this to think about this is Jesus setting up the Last Supper, the communion or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, depending on what tradition you're from, where we'd have the bread and we'd have the wine and it would be the symbolic of his body and of his blood. And that's what he was setting up. I I don't think that's exactly, I think that would become an application for later on. But I don't think that's what he was doing. He was actually inviting them into something that is so important for us. How many of you guys ate breakfast this morning? Any breakfast eaters? You love breakfast? Yes, the most important meal of the day. How many of you guys ate dinner last night? Okay, most everybody. How many of you guys didn't eat yesterday at all? You just didn't eat. Okay, everybody ate yesterday. Are you gonna eat today? Like, why would you do that? You ate yesterday. Like, if you had one meal, why do you need another one? Why? Because you're hungry again. Do you start to see the picture of this? When he says, I want you to walk, and I want you to whoever, whoever eats in my flesh and drinks in my blood, it's kind of implicit that it's gonna be ongoing. Eating and drinking is not a one-time solution. It is an ongoing, life-sustaining way. That's what he's getting at. Whoever learns how to live in this way. Well, you have to, you begin to understand that when Jesus said, and this is what he said. He says, you know, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats of my flesh, whoever eats of this bread will never hunger again. Whoever believes in me will never thirst again. He says this in Matthew 5, when he, the famous Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. How is righteousness revealed? From faith, for faith. The fullness and the character and the essence and the image of God is revealed in us from faith for the next step of faith. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for that. What's the promise? For they will be filled. For they'll be filled. But I don't like this and this, no onions, no, no. And you start like, it's like, no, 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 that's not what he's asking you to do. It's to receive. When you receive, what you realize is that you actually are beginning to get what it is that you want, to trust him in the reality that you've been forgiven. That's what release is about, that you've been forgiven. You don't owe him. You don't have to justify yourself. You are free not to prove yourself anymore. You are forgiven. And then to receive is to walk by faith, to trust him with every single decision. If you want the life, the fullness of life that he's promised, you must take hold of the life that he has given. I'll tell you some about my own story. Because when I was you know, younger, I learned to do a quiet time. I learned how to read the Bible every day and say, God, you know, what are you doing? I surrender to you. It wasn't perfect. But I remember you know, really wanting to walk with God, wanting to know what it was like to live by faith. I wanted that. I always had these suspicions and kind of questions about what God wanted me to do. I wasn't really sure, but I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be an architect and I wanted to be an architect badly. And I wanted to help out the kingdom of God. I wanted to volunteer my church, but I wanted to be an architect. So I went to school, graduated from school, got a job. I was working on this job. And I'd go to do my quiet time every day. And all I could hear is, Mike, you're not doing what I'm asking you to do. I'm like, what? And I didn't know what else to do. And eventually I just, I told, went home and told my wife, I'm quitting my job and I'm gonna go to seminary. And she's like, what? I said, yes, I don't know what else to do because I, I can't keep doing this. I just gotta, I gotta, I feel like God's doing this. I gotta go in that direction. And lest it sounds more faithful than it was, I was kind of hoping she would talk me out of it. And so, we go through this, this whole uh, thing. Anyway, long story short, I, I end up uh, meeting someone who was in Wilmington. So I moved up here. I interviewed at a job, became a youth minister in Wilmington. I was here. I was like, okay, God, I'm finally doing what you want me to do. Now, and we do like everything else. Like, let, let me get stuffed. Let me, let me, this is gonna be fine. I was here just about a year and the wheels came off. Things didn't turn out like I want. And the, the driving emotion in me was I wanna be anywhere else 
other than here. Have you ever felt like that? You've been in a circumstance or a situation that you thought you were being faithful to God. You thought it was, I, I'm like, God, I gave up an architecture career for this. I come here and the wheels fall off. What is this? You, you, you thought I'm gonna do something that God wants me to do. You do it and all of a sudden the wheels come off and things get, get not good at all. So that's where I'm at. So in that moment, I did what anybody, any faithful person would do. I started sending out resumes all over the place. So I get some phone calls, get some interviews. And I'm going through my list of things that I really want. I'm young, I'm 23, 24 years old. I'm like, I wanna, I wanna you know, make sure that I can take care of my family. I've got a wife uh, and, and uh, I think I had a, a child at that time. I didn't have a child. My first, uh, first one was already born. So I was young, had a wife, a kid to take care of. I wanted to get my education. I wanted to go to school. So all this list, I knew that I lived at the beach for about two years, year and a half now. So I knew that God was nowhere, the beach wasn't. So it had to be near a beach. And so I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm laying this down. And so I go and I get this interview at a church uh, down in Florida. So I get on the plane, I fly down um, to Florida, interview. Um, we get there with the person's house we go to is sitting out over the water looking. I'm like, dude, this is where God is. <laughs> um, the interview went really well. Um, they're like, Mike, um, you know, when they started talking, they said, we'll pay for you to go to school. The school's 20 minutes away. It's not two hours away. Um, the money was a lot better. We'll take care of this. We got people, you know, we get your kids. I mean, just the whole thing. I'm like, dude, there, you can't be more God than this. So on the way back on the plane ride, I pulled out, um, I didn't have my, uh, I had some pink copy paper in my briefcase. I pulled it out and I started writing down. I drew a line in the middle. And I said, why should I go to Florida on one side of the page? And why should I stay in Wilmington on the other side of the page? I started to make a list. This is a spiritual thing to do. So I wrote down all the reasons I should go to Florida. More money, opportunity to go to school, better condition for my family, get out of this mess that I'm in, blah, 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 blah. Just a long list. Then I get to there and say, why should I stay in Wilmington? And this is exactly what I wrote. I still have this piece of paper in my office. I don't think that God is finished with me in Wilmington. That's all I had. That's not even a great, like some line in the, you know, stake in the ground, line in the sand statement. I think, I hope, maybe, perhaps God's not done with me in Wilmington. So I called my, my youth minister, who was one of my mentors growing up, and I said, Bill, I got to make this decision about going to Florida. He said, well, make a list of your pros and cons. I said, did. I did. He said, good. Then throw it away and ask God what he wants you to do. <laughs> and so I'm wrestling with this. And he said, Mike, here's the most important thing when you get a sense of what you feel like God is asking you to do, where he's leading you, where he's walking with you. When you get a sense of that, you make a decision. And then he said this, and I'll never forget it. And it's changed my life. He said, and do not second guess. So I get back, wrestling with this, got this big old to-do list. I mean, the big old pros list. And then don't think he's done with me in Wilmington. This is 20... 30 years ago, 27 years ago, hold on, 27 years ago, 28, 28 years ago. So it was 1995, so whatever year that was, 25 years. So I called the church in Florida. Hey, Dr. So-and-so, I called you, want to tell you about what I'm going to do? Oh man, we're so excited, Mike, blah, blah, blah. I said, I'm not coming. He said, well, is, is it the salary? No, 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 it's not the salary. Is it the, is it the school offer? No, 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 it's not the school. Is it the housing? We can, no, no, it's not the housing. Well, what is it? I don't, I don't think God's done with me in Wilmington. <laughs> it's like, what? So I turned the job down and I resolved to stay. Now, if you were God, what would you do? You honor it, right? You make things go well. Well, it got worse. It got worse and it got worse and it got worse, and it got worse. Anybody had that happen? You know what the most tempting thing to do in that moment is? Should have gone to Florida. By God's grace, I never did that. And you know what happened? What I learned was there were some things in my life that God was using that season to root out and to shape in and to reveal to me. There were things that he was using to both encourage me in some places and call me into places that I did not feel I was worthy of or competent in. 
and I had to walk through things. I had to walk and learn how to navigate chaos, being faithful to him when I had nothing else to hold on to. And you know what I found? That the fullness of his image is revealed in my life from faith for faith. You don't have to rush. You don't have to try to get ahead. You don't have to do any of those things. He is so faithful. You know what's so amazing? I think about when I said, God's not finished with me alone. And I had zero idea about any of this. It wasn't an easy road. It hasn't been an easy road. It's not an easy road. But what I've learned is that God is unbelievably faithful if you will trust him and walk in the way that he has called you to walk. We are not gonna end the chaos in our culture. This is not something that you can do flippantly or on the side when he says to seek first the kingdom of God. It's because we don't readily see it with our default vision. We see the storms, we see the waves, we see the wind, and we're like, oh, he says, oh, you have little faith. Like, faith, nothing. You don't see what I see? He said, you're right, I don't. We walk by faith and not by sight. To seek first the kingdom of God means something different. A lot of people I know in this season, you can't see the kingdom of God because you are seeing so firmly through the lens of your political views that you are missing what God is doing. Seek first the kingdom means that becomes the driver for everything else that we see. To seek first his kingdom. And don't be offended by what I said. Just test yourself. Just test yourself. This is about you being satisfied and full and free. That's what it's about. It has nothing to do with me or our politics. Or, it's about you being full and free. We will not end the chaos that we're in. But what I will tell you, if we're going to walk in the way of Jesus, what you learn is to navigate the chaos faithfully. Faithfully. You don't have to worry about what God's going to do next month or next year. You can be confident in what he's doing right now and take that step because that step will lead to the next, faith, uh, next step. It's the promise of revelation. Sometimes we only get enough to take the next step. And sometimes in my experience, you don't even know that the ground is there until you've already stepped. It's just the way it is. It's what he's asking of us. It's how we learn how to receive him. The way of Jesus is a way of faith that is fleshed out in your life and in mine as we live in consistent, dependent, and abiding, uh, a consistent, dependent, and abiding relationship with him. That our choices, every one, every choice that you make, our actions, our words, our attitudes, they are governed by and they are driven by what we receive from him as we receive it from him. You're not gonna eat a week's worth of pizza today. It won't do any good. In fact, it'll do you a lot of bad. You'll eat today and you'll eat tonight and you'll eat tomorrow because that's how it comes. The same thing is true. You're gonna receive from him as you receive it from, you receive from him as you receive it from him. It just comes to us. We draw strength and we draw guidance and we draw wisdom from one dependent moment to the next. Y'all, the way of Jesus begins by responding to his radical invitation to come, to come, to, to release all the things you're holding on to, to receive his forgiveness, to receive his grace and to live this, this way of life as you trust him from moment to moment. Now, one of the things we say around here is we wanna work as hard as we can to get people to Jesus and then work as hard as we can to keep people there. That's where our life is found. That's where we find the fullness and the freedom. For some of you, you've got your menu out, you're looking at all the things you don't like and you're just crossing them off. You're gonna stay hungry and you're gonna stay thirsty and you're gonna keep chasing and chasing and chasing. What I've learned at least a little bit, when you learn how to receive what he's actually given, there's a fullness and a freedom that nothing in this world can touch. So I'm gonna close our time. We're gonna close our time 
but just pausing, kind of positioning ourselves to receive, to receive. And so the band's gonna come in just a minute and um, we're gonna lead us in one of my, just an anthem that's been on my playlist for about two and a half years. And I want us to just experience this together. Father, I thank you for what it is that you have done. That the gospel is a power. It's the power of God for salvation. It is revealed in us from faith to faith. So Father, as we pause, we want to prepare our hearts to just meet you. Perhaps you speak to us very gently, just reminding us that we are forgiven and we are cared for and that you are safe. Our lives are safe with you. For others of us that might be a little bit more stubborn, your words might be a little bit more pointed and challenging because we keep saying no onions and no pickles and no whatever. And you're like, you don't get it that way. Trust me. So Father, as we prepare, I ask that you would meet us in this time and space of, of communion. So Father, meet us. And I lift these things to the name of your son, Jesus, who is our King. Amen. What I want for you to do is we kind of do this. I love this song because of the picture in it. It just says, take me back to the garden, to the moment I saw your face, to the moment I heard your voice. Take me back to that place. And then he says, it was oh so simple. It was easy to love. There was no space between us. It was easy to trust. Let me make this declaration that you are closer, you are closer than my skin. You are the very air that I'm breathing in. Here's where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart begin to beat again. It feels so good to know that you are my friend, that we can walk in an intimacy, in a relationship that is life-giving. Doesn't that sound good? So I want you just to open your hands and just maybe let the words, don't try to declare them, just receive them, just receive them. So I'm gonna ask Brian and Jennifer and Rollin to just lead us in this time to receive, to commune with Jesus.